G'day, I'm Paul Murray. This is Rita Panahi. Where are we? We're at Bar Bambi. Sexy. It's Sexy. Sexy. And it is saucy and it's fun. This book is not, though. This is the new book about Harry and Meghan and the end of the royal family. It is called Endgame. And it's garbage. But we have decided to take one for the team. We're going to read it so you don't have to. We are going to take you through the best or worst bits of this <gasps> catastrophe. And uh, I think this is going to get us into heaven, Paul. <laughs> Let us hold hands and go through the pearly gates. It's written by a bloke who is clearly very Harry and Meghan centric. Oh, he is their unofficial spokesperson. And I tell you, we have taken one for the team here. We've read this catastrophe, oh, so you don't have to. Thank you so much. We begin Endgame oh. with, if you could all please turn your hymn books to page... It isn't even numbered. That's a good sign. All right. Good start. So, this is all apparently about the end of the royal family, in part because of their attitude towards Harry and Meghan. Endgame. The final stages of a chess game after most of the pieces have been removed from the board. Also, the final stages of an extended process or course of events. I think it's not a good sign when you start your book with a dictionary definition of the title of your book. <laughs> it's a little bit like, you it's know... It's like you've already run out of ideas, you've already run out of your own words. Let's start Googling what our title of the book is and what it means and put that into the first page. It's like a world, a year six speech, you know? <laughs> yeah. Freedom. The Oxford Dictionary says freedom. <laughs> All right, now... Let's um, see if it gets any better from I have no doubt. page seven, part mm. of the prologue. Please do. And it's, uh, I think this is all about the king. Mm. The question remains, is he up for the job? Immediately after the queen passed away and ordinary citizens were still shedding tears, mm. the new King Charles made headlines after cameras caught him throwing a tantrum. Oh, no! Over a faulty pen. A stubborn eccentric who has spent most of his life waiting and planning for his ascension, even at the cost of his relationship with his own sons, the former Prince of Wales, is not only far less popular than his predecessor and his successor... His mother! His and his mother. son, <laughs> and his son, he has also been a thorn in the side of the institution. It's interesting that he focuses here on that pen incident. Yes. And you can understand why the king was upset. I mean, they had planned for that day for possibly decades. His mother's just uh, left us. And, and, and the pen doesn't work when he's got to sign a vital document. I would have thought if you're going to talk about the prince being, or sorry, the king now being a bit kooky, you might, I don't know, reflect on wanting to come back as a tampon. <laughs> we have that. Talking to plants. Talking to plants. The whole global warming catastrophist predictions that he's guilty of making every 12 months where we're at the end of the world. But no, we don't have any of that. No, the We've pen. Got... The pen the is pen. the... Yeah. The pen is the... Uh, where Charles is demonised. You see, you don't understand. Mm. You see, the pen is mightier than the sword of which a king or queen wields to uh, oh. make people knights of the realm. See, this guy's 4D chess. That's why he mentioned chess at the start of his book. It's all coming together, Paul. This is spooky. I'm, I'm getting tingles now, people. I'm getting tingles. This bit is, like most of the book, about racism. Some might argue it's unnecessary to bring the Duke and Duchess of Sussex into conversations about the future of the monarchy since they started their separate life in California three years ago. But their role in the bigger royal story remains as important as ever. These issues raised by the couple, including allegations of bullying, misogyny, racism, or Harry's description, unconscious bias. Oh, oh. no transphobia, though. No. Oh, we're winning. Oh, wait till we get to Chapter 14. No. <laughs> <laughs> right, and image manipulation alongside the institutional cruelty that they experienced remained largely ignored and unexamined un 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 by the palace. We're talking here about institutional cruelty, oh. so an unconscious bias. Yeah. Uh, institutional racism uh, comes to mind Look, as well because we know... I know they've tried to walk back the racism mm -hmm. allegations... We've all seen that god-awful Oprah interview. We know the allegation was made. Uh, they, they've tried to pretend, oh, no, 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 we were just uh, raising issues of unconscious bias. Can we talk about this entire catastrophe? Because what they allege, whether you call it unconscious bias, racism, whatever, 
is nothing of the sort. Anyone who's got a mixed race family would tell you, people wonder, who would the kid look like? Yeah. Is it going to look like the uh, someone who's olive skinned or dark skinned, or is it going to look like the freckly ginger? Or you know, it's it's interesting. But also, whose eyes are they going to have? Whose complexion are they going to have? But also, let's be honest. There's not much to say. We're having a baby. Okay, great. Yeah. So we sort of go, oh, so oh, do you think it'll be tall? <laughs> like, like, I mean, eventually something gets said here. Now, this part of the book, Paul, is all about Charles's response to Harry's book, Spare. Ooh. You know, where he talks endlessly about his todger. Is this a response to a response to a response to the thing that happened once, maybe? It, it, it's that, exactly. Now, despite the many opportunities to discuss his grievances mm. ahead of the publication of the book, oh. Charles instead chose to keep his distance for months. Oh. Harry and his father swapped a few words over Christmas 2022, but it wasn't until after the January 10, 2023 re release of the memoir that they had their first proper conversation. Now, are we concerned about that at all? I don't think that's unusual. You're about to publicly, under your own name, yeah. smash your family who you've already trashed. You're now putting it into print. You can't even distance yourself because you've put your name to this. You could have, you know, told a third party like this guy, but you didn't do that. It's an autobiography. Well, think about it in Australia, right? Family members don't speak to family members because they didn't get as much as they want out of uh, Grandma's house that was sold. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine a global publicity tour and a book shit canning everything about your family. I think the king was within his rights to say, you know what, Harry? Uh, no. Yeah, just give me some distance. Let's just uh, continue this thought here. Please. Encouraged by a close friend, the Duke of Sussex reached out to Charles by phone to try to discuss some of the unresolved issues between them. <laughs> it was an awkward conversation, but he knew if he didn't make those first steps, there would never be any progress, said a friend of the prince. Probably the prince himself would give that. There was no raised voices, no arguments, but the king was cold and brief rather than open to any proper dialogue. Let me guess what that might be, Paul, because every single word would be leaked to the media and in the next docu-series. Correct, but hang on. So the prince wants credit <laughs> for writing the book about the family and credit for trying to talk to Dad after the book came out because otherwise the... He wants credit for both breaking and mending the relationship. This is this is like gaslighting type behaviour. Yes. This this is toxic to to a new level. Uh, yeah, it's like me showing up and I don't know, burning down your house and then going, oh, but look, I booked you a room at a hotel for a couple of nights. <laughs> Shouldn't you be happy? I like that she's trying to pretend that this is uh, hypothetical. It happened five years ago. Look, no one can prove it, isn't it? <laughs> so the book bounces around a little bit, and this is something going back to Mexit world as well. Or Mexit world? I'll never get it right. Mexit. Yeah, who cares? All right, uh, page 51. Both the institution and the family still can't seem to come to grips with the fact or move on. I've watched Kensington Palace and Buckingham Palace repeatedly get worried about being upstaged and derailed by the couple, that being Harry and Meghan, and leak negative information on Harry and Meghan, a, tac a tactic that started before they even got married, during moments that could easily be focused on genuine royal news instead. OK, no, no, no. I need to stop you here because there is just so much BS in those few words you've just read Go out. Go for it, baby. Firstly, this entire narrative that the world was against them, the palace was against them, the British people, the media, nonsense. Because I remember when they were getting married, I was by myself almost going, this ain't right. This, this, there's not, something not right about this girl. There's something not right about the dynamic when they were doing appearances together, when they did that interview. And just the fact that at the wedding... Other than her mum, there was nobody else that she actually knew. Like, there were all these celebrities who'd never even met them, but like also, George Clooney and uh, Amal and Oprah and people who had very, very tenuous links to her. But all this garbage, oh, they were leaking before that there was something bad about her or bad about the relationship. Hang on. People literally lined the streets well, this is what I'm for saying. the wedding. Because I was dubious from the start about this girl, but like I said, I was alone because the adulation for this pair, and particularly her, 
was overwhelming, that the goodwill the public had towards them, the media, the number of glowing stories and puff pieces, it was non-stop. So they trashed their own reputation. There wasn't anyone leaking against them. It was the fact that eventually the shine came off and you could... You couldn't deny Correct. that there was something not quite right there and that NQR has just been, you know, <laughs> on blast <laughs> since then. So, yeah, there's not a absolute craziness about that they were systematically destroyed from within with these leaks. Wishful thinking. Garbage. Wishful thinking. Garbage. OK, now we're going to have a look at the Prince Andrew oh. saga. Oh. Mm. Now, while Charles openly detested Andrew's indiscretions, he didn't want to be the one to break his younger brother. You'd find it hard to believe, but he has lay awake many nights worrying about him, a source close to the then Prince of Wales revealed. Charles's reluctance baffled William, who didn't have much confidence in his father to do the right thing anyway. A source close to the prince said at the time, William doesn't think his father is competent enough, quite frankly. Though they share passions and interests, their style of leadership is completely different. Hmm. So now, what? Correct. Now, look, I think in fairness to the king, the reason that he didn't want to break Andrew was because he knows that if he broke Andrew, the first place he'd go would be for a massage. <laughs> and that's what got him into trouble in the first place. Well, there's that. Also, at the time, the Queen was very much alive. Mm. And I think the Queen would have made some decisions there. So I think what she wanted and how she would be impacted would have been top of mind. All right, gorgeous. We now get to the meat and potatoes or kale and Kingbar. tofu. Yeah, of it, of it, depending on your worldview, of course. Chapter 7. Mm. Race and the Royals. Ooh. Institutional bigotry and denial. Ooh. Now, I've got issues immediately. Oh, you are triggered by this. <laughs> well, not just the title and the, the length of this particular chapter, but there's a quote here from the great late Christopher Hitchens. How dare you? This is a disgrace. How dare Omid Scobie quote this great man as some sort of an endorsement of this dribble we're about to bloody unleash upon you. Scobes, I'm telling you, mate. No. Hitchens would have told you to hit the bricks, pal. Absolutely. And if he wasn't such a famous atheist, he'd be haunting you in your sleep. <laughs> but... Actually, do you think... No. If, if you're an atheist, yeah, do you would think... you still go to heaven or hell? Uh, you would, because you can't... Yeah, you would. Or like... maybe you'd be in purgatory. Yeah. Maybe I don't think they let a, you into heaven. We should do a podcast on this. Yeah, let's do that. That's a far <laughs> less controversial topic. Can you believe there is a whole part of this chapter devoted to the palace's reaction to the BLM movement? <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. It's rubbish. Get yourself a stiff drink, because uh, this is going to hurt. During my years covering the royals, I have regularly been surprised by the palace's blasé attitude when it comes to anything to do with race racism or the issues that impact those from minority backgrounds. Oh, God. After Minneapolis police officers <laughs> murdered George Floyd and the resurgence of the American-born Black Lives Matter movement... What is the Royals supposed to do about George Floyd? Oh, but no, but, but that BLM movement spawned <sighs> international protests against systemic, racially motivated police brutality. No, it was just... Mad writing for yeah. no good reason. It was people who remember were against the, the family unit, the nuclear that's family. It. That's it. You know, Mark, cultural Marxists. Neo Marxists, they said, we're trained Marxists. Anyway, police brutality unrest hit the streets of London in May 2020. A global civil rights issue was forcing change around the world, but the royal family chose to completely ignore it. What did they want? The Queen to be oh. posing with a raised fist or. To, to, to denounce capitalism and, and, and the family, uh, nuclear family. Well, like, what were they supposed to do? Like paint paint the Royal Mall, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter, <laughs> like they did out the front of things in Washington. But also, no, remember... I, I'm not going to be satisfied until I see the Royals with some sort of defund the police <laughs> <Yeah>. motif <laughs> around... I mean, cut, this is the most ridiculous part of this book. Well, also, the stupidity of this argument is, is, that, is that it fundamentally... For a bloke who allegedly 
understands the machine of the royal family. He, of course, completely does not understand that it is an apolitical institution. They deliberately don't put their hands on the scales. But the thing is, for this... For this skewered worldview, they think things like, uh, you know, uh, anniversaries of, of military battles mm. are political. So they think that, oh, well, BLM is just as historic well, he, as the Blitz. I'll give you the tip. No, it isn't. It isn't. But he does kind of try to address that, and you will love this explanation. Don't please, if I could just please. continue. The palace famously stays away from anything it considers political. But unlike the political intricacies involved with the movement in the US... BLM support in Britain simply meant standing up to and against racism. Bull <laughs> No, it didn't. They tore down statues and threw it in the bloody True. Thames. They were rioting. They were desecrating monuments. They were causing all sorts of vandalism and, and property damage and there were acts of violence. Well, and also, it's not to about... say it was just standing up against racism. But also, it's not about standing up. I thought it was about taking a knee. <laughs> That's right. We ended up taking the knee. Um, so th that in itself, this, this entire book is an exercise in gaslighting. Correct. And that's why we're suffering through it, so you don't. Be thankful. Be very thankful. And furthering the gaslighting, but also going pretty low here, is to make the point about Harry and Meghan, we have to go back to see the fundamental roots in racism of the royal family and also their associations with the Nazis. So what, right. we're going back to the 1930s here. Yeah, correct. Oh. This is very odd. All right. Unless we forget the Duke of Windsor's... Unless we forget the Duke of Windsor's disturbing relationship with Adolf Hitler and the infamous images of Queen Elizabeth II as a young, no doubt innocent girl, giving the Nazi salute, an image the institution is desperate to bury. Well, yes. She was a... Oh, she anyway, was a child. the royal. And... Oh, okay, sorry, no, 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 please. The royal family spent much of the 20th century dealing with and often trying to cover up race scandals. What? No. The Queen as a kid. <laughs> all right. The Queen as a kid. But again, the suggestion being, oh, see, it was so frequently mentioned around the house that she just thought she might be able to give it a little mention you, here or you, there. You can't say something that ridiculous, like they've spent. Uh, much of the 20th century dealing with and trying to cover up race scandals. Yeah, name them. Name them. Prince Philip. Name them. Prince Philip. Name them. Prince Philip. That's, that's not, the scandal. That's not. That's well, That's the 20th century, is it? That's the 20th century for you. He did say some weird stuff. He did say some weird stuff, <laughs> but. Uh, that's not... I mean, they've had a lot of scandals to deal with. They've had a lot of things they would like underreported. Uh, but race wasn't at the centre of probably 95% of it, if not more. Uh, yes. <laughs> Prince Philip did provide some moments, didn't he? <laughs> he... He was, as they say, of a different era. Yes, yes. Let's now ponder the pain, the anguish mm. Megan has mm. been subjected to. Oh, it must be so difficult. difficult. And this was just, you know, after she left Deal or No Deal. <laughs> <laughs> she could have had a fulfilling life opening and closing mm. little briefcases, mm. but here we are. Mm. Page 159. Mm. The palace's obvious indifference to Meghan's predicament oh, sent yeah. an undeniable message to people of colour everywhere. I know I was shook. <laughs> to little black princesses everywhere, everywhere in the world. Really? Even a person of colour like Meghan, an admittedly white passing and privileged biracial woman... What does that mean? ..is still subject to racial bias and gaslighting in a publicly funded institution that is globally celebrated by leaders and kingmakers. The royal establishment's reluctance to speak out against the racism oh. or to at least protect a victim of it among their own ranks indicates how retrograde thinking still poisons the heart of this often revered family operation. The fundamental issue about Megan is not about race. It's that she never wanted to play along with the institution. She never understood the institution having a hierarchy to it, right? She thought, my awesomeness gets to come in where I get to marry someone 458th in line to the throne. <laughs> but my awesomeness will mean that the people will suddenly rise us up to number one. So she never seemed to understand that she was never going to end up as the Queen of England, right? But she wanted to carry on like she was the inevitable Queen of England. And guess what? The institution went, sorry, 
in this institution, which is about hierarchy, you have a place. And your place, place is not future queen. It was. And, and, but it wasn't like she was, you know, in the outer family. She was at, still in the core. And I think she knew precisely what she was getting into because you listen to some of the accounts of her childhood friends. This was something that was of great interest to her. So I think becoming a princess and having that title was something that she absolutely coveted. But I thought, I think she thought it was just going to be all champagne and celebrities and and uh, adulation, not realising, one, of course you're going to have media scrutiny, you're a high-profile person, two, the day-to-day -day tasks of a royal are pretty mundane and boring. If they're not glamorous, it's turning up to events with uh, community groups and, and putting in the hours every day doing that. And I don't think that's her style. Well, but also, fundamental to this whole racism question that's pushed through all through this. And this is like a real sort of college, university definition of those things. If this deeply racist institution that couldn't care less about BLM, all the rest of it, do you think there's a chance <laughs> that someone somewhere in one of these pages, in one of these books, would have a quote from a single person saying, don't marry her? No. Instead, never happened. No, and nobody was even concerned about her background, the fact that she was previously married, the fact that she's got a uh, mixed-race uh, family. No-one cared about that. It was she who put race at the centre of everything because that was her way to play the victim. And it was at a time where we had... Uh, all sorts of race obsessions mm. racing through the media, the BLM movement. So she found her little niche there. Mm. But I think even the most race-obsessed person would be tiring of her continuous victim playing here. She's a bloody princess. Now, Paul, as you might remember, in Spare, Harry detailed that uh, clash with William mm. where they fell to the ground oh. and his chain broke. <laughs> oh, and I remember, wasn't it a dog bowl or something that ended up lacerating his back? And he immediately called his psychologist, as you do, because they're, oh, they're on speed dial. I've been attacked by my brother and a dog bowl! So, I mean, you know, was that adequately covered? Mm, no. The book delves into this. This may be true with children, but one doesn't expect this kind of behaviour from the future king and head of the Church of England, who was 37 at the time. <laughs> Far from seeming cold and unfeeling, William's desperate collar-grabbing bid to get Harry to uh, show just how much love he has for his little brother, it made him look edgy, wrote the Telegraph's royal editor, Camilla Tamini, bizarrely sounding like the excuses of domestic abuses everywhere. Oh, domestic come. abuses! This is brothers having a little push and shove, not even a real fight. But it goes on. Imagine if it were the other way around. People would be calling for criminal charges to be pressed against Harry for his Sussex title to be taken away. Are we seriously likening a couple of brothers grabbing each other by the collar to domestic violence to abuse but also this is how thin this <laughs> book is right that he's outraged at an imaginary scenario of whom the aggressor was yeah. so he can't even stick to what happened here instead of, well imagine if it was the other way around okay well imagine there was an alien that landed on the top of uh, buckingham palace yes i can imagine it but guess what if it didn't happen it's your imagination and even if we take what he says here. Imagine if it was the other way around. You know what? We would never know about it because William didn't go and write a bloody autobiography talking about his todger and stupid incidents like this. How many mentions of todger do we have in spare? I don't know, but every time you mention it, the internet goes nuts. I think it was more than a dozen, but I will come back with, with that. Someone a to will, a someone todger's will dozen. Check in the a todger's dozen. A todger's dozen. <laughs> Now, my Persian princess, uh, the future king of England, if we're just being royal, you deserve your appropriate title here in Bar Bambi, wonderful location in Melbourne. Uh, mention our name, pay full price. Where uh, <laughs> this is about William, future king, having his issues with uh, Harry and Meghan and the California obsession with therapy, OK? Now, the king-in-waiting believes that Harry and Meghan blindsided the family, even the queen, with their public comments and their oh-so-California self-importance, 
an opinion he has repeatedly voiced in various ways to friends and aides during the past two years. Convinced Harry's been, quote, brainwashed by an army of therapists. That is the most insightful thing in this entire book. It's quoting William, supposedly, but absolutely. When you hear Harry talk, you can hear those phrases and you can know he's been in through a lot of therapy and yes for some people therapy is very much necessary but I think the great Jordan Peterson a uh, well famous psychologist himself says the more you obsess about yourself and think about yourself the more miserable you are and those of us who've seen Harry grow up Correct. he's gone from this happy go lucky sunny disposition type of a dude to this miserable looking guy who's got the world he's got his wife he's got two healthy kids he's got riches he's got his independence and yet he couldn't look more miserable what's well, the thing he's sort of looking at scandals around the corner trying to invent these things in order to have the victim narrative and mm. as you say about uh, dr peterson you know what what's that term sort of uh, paralysis by analysis mm. right and and it's, again self-reflection is all good and important but if it becomes it just becomes this cycle down, 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 and we are where we are. Well, and the, the therapy he's having doesn't seem to have any sort of personal responsibility angle to it. Correct. It's all about how I've been wronged by my family, by the media, by uh, society. It's all about uh, everyone's against him, and it's a him and Megan against the world. It's, it's, it's toxic. Well, and guess what? Red flags everywhere. That is also California. That is also California. William's on the money there, or whoever's uh, inventing those quotes for him. <laughs> now, the book does also cover the passing of the Queen, naturally, and uh, let's just have a look at what uh, Omid has to say here. By the next morning, the Sussexes had no idea that Buckingham Palace was already planning for the Queen's final hours and the first days of the monarchy's new era, until the Duke's phone started ringing. An unknown number. He usually ignored those. You should answer it, Megan told him. He tapped accept just before it stopped. Harry hadn't spoken to his father much that year, but this was not the time for any father and son tension. Charles told him he and Camilla were about to leave Dumfries House for Balmoral, where Princess Anne was already by the Queen's side. He told Harry to make his way to Scotland immediately. William, whom Charles had just spoken to, was supposedly working on arranging travel. Harry sent a text message to his brother asking how he and Kate planned to get to Scotland and whether they could travel together. No response. Oh! It's incredible that we've got direct quotes here from Megan. We've got mm. details like a private number popping up. Mm. right? And I didn't find... It's almost like Harry and Megan are... The sources behind this book. In fact, possibly the only sources uh, behind this book. How could you possibly say that? There are quotes from only one side of a conversation? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yes, yes. This is... Um, he's not even artful about covering covering up whose sources are here. I think his assumption is, if you've made it to page 204, you know who's really behind <laughs> this book. That This is for the hard cause now. So we've now moved to the Queen has passed away mm -hmm. and Harry is furious. His team literally had to beg for them to wait for his plane to land and they reluctantly agreed to hold the statement back for a little bit. Confirmed a close family source. Yeah, <laughs> Megan. Uh, but a stormy weather over Aberdeen International forced Harry's plane to circle the airport numerous times before landing. Patients at the Buckingham Palace press office wore thin. They could wait no longer and the announcement went live at 6.30pm. When Harry's plane finally touched tarmac 20 minutes later, he received a text from Meghan urging him to call as soon as possible, followed by a breaking news alert via the BBC News app with the announcement of the Queen's death. Palace sources later briefed certain papers that Charles had personally shared the news with his younger son, but this was just a move to save face. Harry was crushed, said a friend of the Duke. That would be just Harry himself. Yeah. He has no friends. His relationship with the Queen was everything to him. She would have wanted him to know before it went out to the world. They could have waited just a little longer. It would have been nothing in the grand scheme of things, but no one respected that at all. Okay. I have certain thoughts uh, here. Okay. You go first. Okay. All right, a few things mm. here. Um, 
nothing spreads faster than gossip and nothing spreads faster than the news of the death of the Queen, all right? Now, the reality was, as loyal as the staff, and this was going to get out, OK? They held it for as long as they possibly could. But this idea that he's turning around saying, oh, well, it's what she would have wanted. Well, what she also would have wanted was for you not to shit can the family all day, every day. Hallelujah. Absolutely. And we're not just talking about his grandmother here. We're talking about the head of state, not of just Great Britain, but the head of state of of the Commonwealth nations. 100%. So her passing is a event that needs to be announced in a timely matter because she is the head of state. She is not just someone's grandmother. That, that's just the reality there. Uh, if he wanted to be there sooner, he should have been there sooner. And again, the self-obsession here. The Queen has just passed away. The nation is mourning. People around the world were mourning. And all we can think about is... I found out via the BBC app or a text message from Megan. I didn't get a phone call 20 minutes earlier. I mean, the self-obsession, the sense of entitlement this ginger has is <laughs> out of bounds. No wonder he's miserable. Nothing can satisfy you if you're that entitled. But also, we've all, sadly, lost grandparents over the years, all right? Uh, nine times out of ten, it's not a shock. We know that it's coming, which means... As soon as it starts to get close, you clear your schedule. It's not up to them. Yeah. It's up to you to be there for maybe a week, mm. maybe two weeks. Because if this is a central relationship to you, then you would say to your missus, look, can you take care of the kids for the next little while? I, I have to be here. And whether they like it or not, I'm going to turn up. But instead... He wants, he wants it both ways. He wants the complete separation to live in another country on the other side of the coast of that country mm. and the um, I must be by her bedside holding her hand in her dying breath. And you touched on it there. The grief he would have brought for the Queen in her final years cannot be... 100%. ...overstated. She would have been devastated. The institution she devoted her life to, her own family being trashed in this cheap, nasty manner, you know, TV interviews and reality shows. Yep. And, and so I think she would be absolutely appalled by what became of Prince Harry. And, and I'm, I'm no doubt they had a very special relationship, but that didn't seem to count for much when he was doing interviews with Oprah and then having the Queen's husband, his grandfather be cast as some sort of a racist yeah. because everyone suspected he was the one who was worried about Archie's uh, skin colour. But also, this is not a conspiracy, it's karma. It's karma saying, you know what, you are going to miss this moment. And for whatever magical forces in the world, you're missing this moment. So now the atheist believes in karma. Interesting. Well, I'm we, a we're getting more spiritual as we I'm go. I'm a contradiction. By the end of this show, we might both have an awakening. Wouldn't that be special? <laughs> you will see the scales fall off Saul's eyes and Paul will see <laughs> the path. Now, Rita, I think it is fair to say that there hasn't been enough Megan in this book, so it is important we get back to the most important member of the royal family. Um, and it talks in this part about how she claims to have been ignored at the Queen's funeral. For the duration of the time in Britain, the Duke and Duchess were on the receiving end of snubs and brush-offs mm. at the state funeral, Camilla, Kate and Sophie noticeably went out of their way to ignore Megan outside of Westminster Abbey. Well, the thing is, we've got some footage. Uh, and I hope you're watching the footage right now because it doesn't show that whatsoever. I'm shocked. I'm shocked such a truthful account of everything that's happened would, would have something false in it. This has shook me to my core, Paul. To I need my a moment. Core, to mine. I need a minute. Now, you'll recall that what they call the Fab Four walk. Mm. Uh, the, the first appearance of uh, William, Kate, Harry, Megan all together um, appearing and the public going, this was one of those moments nobody expected. I remember being in London at mm. the time and on air when it actually happened. And this was one of those moments to remember in that crazy week after the passing of the Queen. This is the book, page 206. Are you telling me there's... More than what I understood the moment to mean. Uh, the depths here mm. are astonishing. Please. 
Essentially, he told William to swallow his pride and invite his brother and sister-in-law to join them when they greeted mourners and well-wishers in Windsor that day, said a palace source. William wasn't keen. This was his moment with the public, but the king put pressure on him. With around 40 minutes left before he planned to step out on Windsor Castle's long walk with Kate, William sent his first text message in months to Harry, suggesting it would be good if they came along too. The couple wanted to do what was right, but time was short. Meghan, in sneakers with her hair pulled up, had only just come back from a walk. The couple's head of communications, Ashley Hanson, gave the couple a pep talk. It doesn't matter how little time you have, just get out there and do it, oh. she told the couple. And with that, the Sussexes quickly got ready and made their way to the courtyard of Windsor Castle. Though they had seen William and Kate since their big exit, including at the Platinum Jubilee celebrations, this was the first time the couples had to, uh, had to actually talk as a foursome. The silence as they climbed into the same car, a decision made by Lee Thompson, William and Kate's press secretary, was very noticeable. Given the tension between the brothers and zero communication between Meghan and Kate, the 150-second car ride oh! to the long walk felt like two hours <laughs> yes. as they muddled through light, small talk. None of this is astonishing. Yeah. So what, you've only got 40 minutes to get ready for, what, a walk? Where yeah. you take some flowers from people and but, make small talk? But also, sort of, this, this is where, this is, the, again... This is where we get right into the detail, right, about who is the information source here, right? It's all obviously from Harry and Meghan's perspective and quite specifically into Meghan's perspective. But also, the way that the author tries to cover this up and tries to paint the picture that he wants you to eventually get, which is Meghan was just going for a walk because that's what fit and responsible people do. She just was wearing a pair of sneakers like normal people do. And then at a moment's notice, she had to glam up. But because of her awesomeness, she was able to, to, just, to glam she up. She only had 40 minutes to to get ready for, for a walk. I mean, how much preparation pep talking do you need to basically walk alongside your husband, speak to some mourners collect flowers, people have only got nice things to say to you, comforting things to say to you, and then uh, that's it. Well, funny you say that, because this book claims some people didn't say nice things to her. Oh, no, this this goes on. Mm. There's, there's more. Though her appearing composed, sources said Megan, sources said Megan was extremely nervous about being in front of the crowds. By this point, the couple's rapidly declining popularity in the United Kingdom was an inarguable fact. Yeah. The level of vitriol... The true thing in the book. <laughs> the level of vitriol aimed at Meghan in particular, whether online or in the newspapers, no, was no, worse no, than no. ever. Armed royal protection officers were on high alert. No. And so was she. Some supporters gathered in the crowd didn't hide their animus towards the Duchess. Of course, we would get stuck with her, moaned one woman within earshot of Meghan. <laughs> woman is I want to buy her a beer. <laughs> Another was seen on camera grimacing after shaking the Duchess's hand while others refused to put their hand out. When I saw the videos of Meg I could see she was doing her best to hold it together. She looked terrified said one of her close friends. That's Megan. She's got her close friends. Yeah, correct. When a 14 but also giving year herself her own nickname. I'm not Megan, just to my friends, I'm Meg. Meg. When a 14-year-old fan stopped to chat with Megan, their hug choked the Duchess up. I just wanted to show her that she's welcome here and wanted to hug her oh. after everything that happened, said the teen. Oh. Oh, dear me. Can we have a moment's silence for oh. Megan, please? But again, oh. remember the context. This is all after... The Queen, an, an intergenerational beloved figure of almost 100 years of age and 80 years on the throne, right? There was very few people in England who, do, who remember anything but her as the monarch, right? Mm. The depth of that moment, she still is able to turn into herself. The, the recollections are still about herself. The emotions of the people... Nobody turned mm. up to Windsor, by the way, with an expectation of a public walk. Yeah. It's a surprise. So the idea that somebody sort of turned up in order to be nasty is not no. true. And, and if the harshest thing they can come up with is, of course, we would get stuck with her, 
then you got off lightly. Correct. Because I can tell you, yes, there was animus towards Harry and Meghan. Well-placed animus because they had put the Queen through hell in her final years. They had put the family through so much grief. And as we've discussed previously, one of the really ugly things about how they went about it is they threw out these allegations knowing full well Kate and uh, Will or the Queen wasn't going to sit down with Oprah and come back at them. There's it no was a response. free hit 100%. because they have to maintain a certain decorum. Because <laughs> it was. They were turning the royal family into the Jerry Springer show. Correct. God, that was a fun show. God, that was awesome. Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. Rest in peace. <laughs> Now, one of the frequent criticisms of this pair is the amount of lecturing they do, things on climate change, but then they take private jets everywhere. So people look at that and go, you fat hypocrites. I've seen your videos. It's a good point and I agree. <laughs> well, that's responded to in the book. Let's go to page 239. Harry and Meghan had valid reasons for flying by jet, but privately acknowledged that the criticism served as a lesson learned moment. I'm helping them. Wonderful. Oh, thank you. As for the complaints that they were in France instead of visiting the Queen and Prince Philip in Balmoral during their summer stay, they hadn't been explicitly asked, but all family <laughs> members had an open invite. What? Their answer was simple. They felt four-month-old Archie was too young for all the hunting, shooting and fishing <laughs> that fill up the family itinerary at the Highland Getaway. I don't think anybody expected four-month-old Archie to actually be on horseback hunting down steers. Is, is that what yeah, they expect? But also, what? geez, I wonder which member of the family may have had that opinion. The man who served in Afghanistan or the lady from Suits? <laughs> yes, because remember Harry loved hunting. Yeah, that was one of his pastimes, and that's one of the things Megan made him give up. But also, I, look, these houses that the royals are in, pretty big block of land. I don't think you'd even hear a shot being fired. Oh, it's astonishing. The, the, even in this book, their unofficial spokesperson cannot deny the fact that they had an open invite as a family member to be there. So they didn't need to be explicitly asked. So Harry and Meghan, well, of course, they have big fans in us and they have no bigger fan than Piers Morgan and he gets a <laughs> shout-out in the book. When Piers called the Duchess of Sussex Pinocchio Princess and then a race baiter on Good Morning Britain, it was Camilla who quietly thanked him for defending the firm. Camilla will never publicly comment on anything or speak ill of others, but she will always know someone who can do that for her, says a former palace aide. So, firstly, a palace aide, I wonder who the quote might be. <laughs> and secondly, Piers was pretty clear in his response to this, which is mm -hmm. Also, he's a liar. And I'll tell you how I know he's a liar, because he writes a bit about me in the book. I know, I was going to ask you about that. Did I, I got a copy of, of the book today, and I just checked, as you do, it's a digital copy. I did a little search, up I come three or four times. And on one occasion, he states, as a fact, that I have regular phone conversations with Queen Camilla. For the record, I have never had a single phone conversation with Queen Camilla. Now, he says, as a fact, in his book, that we have regular phone conversations. That I know personally know is an absolute lie. He also says that when I said on Good Morning Britain that Meghan Markle was Princess Pinocchio, uh, that apparently she reached out to me, Queen Camilla, to thank me for standing up for the firm. Did she? I had zero contact with Queen Camilla around that time at all. So you've at got all. no embossed thank you notes no, from Camilla nothing, before she was a queen? Nothing. Is there any communication? I did, however, as I said publicly at the time, have conversations with several other members of the royal family, but it wasn't Queen Camilla. Now let's get into the Meghan Diana comparisons. Oh, which I wonder if it'll be favourable. <laughs> <laughs> the couple seem to be preoccupied with this. Before it all went wrong, the firm's American outsider and underdog was becoming the star of the show. Of course she was. Whether it was guest editing an entire September issue of British Vogue <laughs> while heavily pregnant... Wow. Oh, how could you do it? I mean, the strain! Releasing a best-selling book for charity or collaborating with British fashion brands to launch a capsule collection to These raise money... These are all one-hour one meetings! ..for a patronage of the Women's Employment coaching charity Smartworks 
Meghan got things done fast. Oh, yeah. It was Princess Diana all over again. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. And again, the contradictions here, because on the one hand, we're led to believe that Everyone was against them. The public hated them because the public's racist and society's racist. And yet, they're saying she was the star. She was the one everybody loved and was impressed by. So pick a story, guys. Just pick one. So at least some idiots will believe your version of events but because the, the, the contradictions throughout this book are alarming. But also, what I find kind of creepy about the constant want to say that she's Princess Diana again, that means... Harry married his mum, mm. and that's creepy. Oh, it's super creepy. I mean, do I need to take you back to Harry's book and the, and the cream on the todger and I'm the stop memories? Stop the todger talk! I didn't write the book. Finally, finally we have got to the end. The coronation. Ta-da! It's all about Meghan, though. Mm. With Meghan at home in California, Prince Harry's solo attendance was a striking reminder of the missed opportunity the monarch had to bring his entire family together before the public witnessed this royal milestone. It wasn't for lack of effort on Harry's side who made it clear to his father after the January release of his memoir that he hoped to have a proper conversation about events of the past. Sure. A chance for both sides to take accountability where necessary. Instead, Charles was stubbornly hard to pin down. The Sussexes spent the first few months of the year unclear about whether they were even invited to the coronation. His responses to Harry's inquiries about his attendance were vague at best. I haven't decided, he told his son during an early February phone call that Harry initiated, and he didn't officially make up his mind until late March. As for Harry, while he had an extensive list of reasons for skipping the proceedings altogether, no, no. shortly before making the trip, he told a source that supporting his father as the fifth in line to the throne still outweighed the other things. Oh, the heroic <laughs> nature of this man. OK, now, so much, so much in this. OK, the whole, oh, they missed a historic, wonderful opportunity. Um, they do know that when they were working out the seating plan, they put Harry behind the lady with the massive hat, all right? They were not interested in it. There was, there was no massive, wonderful moment. And guess what? Yet again, just like the funeral of your grandmother, when your dad becomes the formal king of England and its realms, it's not about you. It's not about you. And again, the, the, the way that story is told, it's obvious Harry and Meghan are the primary, if not the only sources for this book. And possibly the reason why his father is having short conversations with him, same with Prince William, is that everything they say ends up in the media. It's extraordinary that this couple who said they fled the UK primarily because of the media attention and the toxic nature of that attention do nothing but leak to the media. It seems to be their full-time job. <sighs> Paul, Paul, I, I feel traumatised. I think I need to call Harry's counsellor. <laughs> and get some treatment because this is this has been a taxing experience. I, I, you know how uh, with books they have those little recommendation quotes on it? Can I officially put the one in from Paul and Rita? Um, Endgame is so lightweight, it's not even a paperweight. <laughs> oh, that rhymes. Ah, see? Uh, all right, enough of this crap. Let's go get a drink. Let's get a drink, yes. Oh, 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 Thank you, darling. Give me a cuddle. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, God.